If you have your Bible, if you want to turn with me, you can turn with me to <coughs> Acts chapter 10. We're, we're going through the book of Acts together, and we kind of got stuck. I've got stuck in chapter 10 and have thoroughly enjoyed the challenge that it's been to my life. And we've kind of broken it down and done several weeks, and, and maybe today is my favorite part of the whole story. You see in, uh, in Acts chapter 10, Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, those, are, those were the things they did, the Acts, the events, the behaviors, the Acts that they acted out. That's what the book of Acts is about. It's about these guys, these primarily these couple of men. One of them was Simon Peter, You're probably familiar with Simon Peter. He was a, used to be a fisherman in Jesus when he was on earth. He called him and said, uh, Peter, why don't you come follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And, and he was just an old grungy fisherman and God, Jesus raised him up to be a, a strong leader. And, and he was a leader in the very first church way back there in Jerusalem. And, and things were going really great. And then because of persecution, the church scattered. And, and he found himself far away from home. And, and in this story this morning in Acts chapter 10, I, a, a, a Sergeant Cornelius, a Roman soldier, a Roman centurion who was over about 100 men, remember that the Roman Empire was in charge. They were in control. They had conquered and they were in charge of all of Israel and much of the known world at that point. And so a Roman soldier calls for Simon Peter to come to his house and share whatever's on his heart. I think I have that. Uh, so Cornelius calls him and Simon Peter comes and Cornelius shares his little word and then he said, here we are. We're all present in this room. He invited a bunch of friends and a bunch of close family members and it was a room full of folks. And he said, uh, Simon Peter, here we are. Share with us whatever the Lord's told you. It says, verse 34, it says that Simon Peter said, uh, he began to speak and and I said last week, we talked about this verse last week, but Simon Peter was far away from home. And there was a room full of people that were very, very different from Simon Peter. You see, he grew up in church and synagogue all of his life. And he was a good Jewish boy and knew all the rules and knew all the regulations and knew how people ought to act. And, and now on this day up in this little town far away from home, Simon Peter looks across this room at a room full of people that are very, very different from him. Before Simon Peter said the first word, I, I almost imagine he had this look on his face. Maybe he had his poker face and didn't change faces, but I almost imagine that he just stood there and he, he looked around the room and made eye contact perhaps with everybody in the room. There he was and the first words out of his mouth were, you know, here I am far away from home with these people that are so different from me. But you know, they're not so different from me. These people aren't so different from me. Peter began to speak, verse 34 tells us, now I really understand. I've been in church and synagogue all my life and I've had all these preconceptions and these pre-notions about what it meant to be a good person. But he says, now I really understand that God doesn't show favoritism. I know how I did it, and I know how I've lived, and I know how I grew up, but I look at people who were different from me, and I say, those people aren't really so different from me. God doesn't show favoritism. He goes on and He says, instead I realize that in every nation, going to verse 35, in every nation, uh, uh, every people, people who just do two things, fear God. What's that mean to fear God? It means it's just to, to have a reverence and a respect for God. And in every area of your life, when I go to work, when I go to play, in my relationship with my wife, in my relationship with my, my children, with my finances, in every area of my life, I fear God and recognize that He's here in my life. Whoever fears God and whoever does righteousness, whoever does what's right, Anybody who does that is acceptable to Him. And in me, old Simon Peter, that's new, for, that's new and different for me because I always had, I knew exactly, I knew exactly what Tyler ought to look like and I knew exactly how he ought to be and I knew exactly how he ought to act and I thank Him for sitting on the front row this morning and, and it, don't we do that, don't we? 
I know what a, I know what a good person looks like. Simon Peter says, man, I look around at people that are very different from me, and I realize that a person who fears the Lord and who does what's right, those are the people that are acceptable to God. Then I imagine Peter may have said something. Thank you for letting me share that personally about me. I do have a story here to tell you this morning. I thank you for or this afternoon. It was actually about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right before we go have a, a big banquet that Miss Cornelius has fixed. Right before we eat, I do have some things to share with you. And he starts in verse 36. And he says, You know, God sent the message to the Israelites. Now, before you yawn, can I just ask you the question? Do you sometimes wonder what the Bible's all about? All of those begats and all of those, uh, all of those stories that seem so far away and distant from us now in 2017. Peter said, you know what was happening? What was really happening is that God sent His message to the Israelites so when you read the whole Old Testament, why the Israelites? is because God needed a family. God wanted, from the very beginning, God wanted to bring somebody into planet Earth to help me and to, to save me from my sins from the very beginning. And to do that, God wanted a family. So He picked Father Abraham way back in Genesis 12. And basically the entire Old Testament is simply the story of Father Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob and his 12 sons uh, who became the 12 sons of Israel and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. That's the story of the Old Testament. You see, he gave this story. He had to give it to a family. And when you go back and read the Old Testament, you read those stories, you say, good night, could God not have picked a better family? He should have picked my family. We're a whole lot more functional than the dysfunctional Abraham's family. But God picked a family and He picked it because of one man, Abraham, had faith. And he believed God. And so the whole entire story of the Old Testament is really just a story of one family that He chose to send to the Israelites. What was the message of that story that He wrote, wrote in the Old Testament? It was a story that proclaimed the good news can I just say to you that sometimes in America even today, the, the, the church and God and Jesus and Christianity, it kind of gets a bum rap. And part of it's our own fault because we've done stupid stuff for a very long time. But can I just remind you that the message, the entire message of the Bible is really, really good. If you've had a bad experience in church and we church people have messed it up for you, can I just apologize to you on our behalf? Because the truth of the matter is the message of the Bible is good news. It's good news about peace. Now, I've said it a bunch recently. When you look around at the United States of America and you read the news, don't you get the sense that there's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of lack of peace. People are going out and they're killing one another and, and there's, there's no unity in our government. There's no unity within the races. It, there, there, people just don't have peace. Can I just say to you that the good news that God wrote to this whole book, it's a, it's a message of peace for your heart. For my heart, for the problems and the disappointments and the disillusionment and the unmet expectations and the broken relationships and all of the stuff that happens in my life, do you know what God wants to do? <clears throat> he wants to bring peace. He wants to give me rest when I have unrest. That's the good news. That's the message of the entire Bible. It is a, new, it is a message of peace. It is a message of, of good news about of peace because it's about Jesus Christ. Now again, I would say to you that I don't know what your experience has been. Sometimes, often, Jesus Christ gets a really bum rap. People, people uh, have different conceptions and misconceptions and misunderstandings about Jesus Christ and it's often because of what's happened in, maybe in their lives in church. And I would just remind you, Peter is saying to these people, hey you all, peace 
I've got good news about peace, and it comes through Jesus Christ. He can help you with whatever situation is going on in your life that's bringing unrest, that's bringing this discontentment, this, this uh, dissatisfaction, whatever it is going on in your life. Jesus Christ can do that. How can He do that? How can Jesus Christ do that? Well, because He is the Lord of everything. Now, Peter was standing in this room full of people, and they were Romans, many of them Romans, and the Romans were in charge of the world. That was the Roman Empire that was in charge of the world. They're the ones who ruled the world. They're the ones who gave the rules. They're the ones who told people what to do, and people did exactly what they said. And Peter said, I've just got to, I've just got to share with you that Jesus, He's the Lord of all. <clears throat> He's the Lord of everything. Can I just come right back down to July 2017? I just prayed for whatever's going on impossible for your life. Do you know how Jesus Christ can take that situation and He can solve it and resolve it and fix it and do the impossible in your life in 2017? It's because He's the Lord of everything. He's the Lord of all the little, all the little checkerboard pieces, all the chess pieces. He's, the, he's able to take all of those threads that don't seem like they make sense and He's able to weave a picture and we look at, I'm sure Abraham for many, many, many years, Abraham and Sarah held that little baby and looked back and said, Oh, that's what God was doing in my life. That's how He was taking the little loose threads and He was sewing them together to draw a beautiful picture of my life. How can He do that in your life in 2017? Because He's the Lord of everything. He's the master, He's in charge, He's the CEO, He's the boss. He's got the whole world in His hands. Whatever it is in your life that is keeping you from peace, <clears throat> Jesus Christ can bring you peace because He's in charge of the whole thing. And Peter goes on and he says, he says I don't mean to, I don't want to uh, uh, assume your knowledge. I don't know what you know or don't know. He goes on to verse 37 and he says, he said, do, do you all know the events that happened? Do you know the events that happened over here? Give me the first bullet there. Do you know the events that happened in down here in Judea, this region? There's Jerusalem over in Israel. The, the events that took place in Judea, actually they started up there in Galilee. You, you see up there in the left-hand corner of the Sea of Galilee, that's where I used to fish at before Jesus called me. I was a fisherman up there on the sea. The events that happened in Judea, but they started in Galilee up there because that's where Jesus grew up at. The event started there, and, and I don't know if you would heard about that or not. I know you all don't have internet yet up here in Caesarea. That's where he was at, up here at the end of that red line. I know you don't have internet yet. I know you don't have cable TV. I don't know if you've heard the events yet or not, but the events that happened up there in, in Judea and started in Samaria, beginning, or beginning there in Galilee, do you remember those events? It was after the baptism that John <coughs> preached. Do you all remember that John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, he baptized people and he, he told people, hey, Jesus is coming, this guy's coming, this guy's coming, I'm not worthy to tie his shoes, but he's coming. And he baptized people and, and one of the people he baptized was his cousin Jesus. John baptized Jesus there in the Jordan River. Did you, do you, are you all familiar with those events? Peter said, maybe you've heard about those things. Verse 38, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Can I ask y'all, will you raise your hands this morning if you all use the word anoint in a sentence this week? We don't use that word, do we? Sometimes that word's, uh, are they going to bring the snakes out too? Are they going to have an anointing? What's going on here? In a few weeks, I'm, I'm going to go to the beach. We're going, well, I'm going with the Hope's family to our annual Labor Day uh, weekend, get together, family reunion. Y'all pray for me. So when I get there, when I get to the beach, before I go out on the beach, I'm going to anoint myself with oil. I'm going to wrap my off from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I'm going to cover myself. I'm going to anoint myself with oil. That's the same idea. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Do you remember what happened on the day that John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River? Do you remember the voice that came down from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He anointed Jesus with what? With the Holy Spirit. Let me just take a minute and give you a Greek lesson. That word spirit is the Greek word pneumatos, from which we would get pneumonia which is an infection of the lungs. The word pneumatos literally means breath. 
The picture is Jesus comes up out of the water and the voice comes down from heaven and God says, I'm going to anoint you all over with my holy my breath. God anointed, covered Jesus from the top of his head to the sole of his feet with his with his with God's breath. And when you you know what happens when you get anointed with God's breath, you also get power with that. You get God's power. That's what happened on that day. I don't know how much you all know up here in Caesarea, but that's what happened. Jesus' a cousin, John, baptized him. When he came up out of the water, he, God anointed him or breathed on him. His breath and his power. Do you know what it was able to cause Jesus to do? Jesus went about doing good. Again, sometimes Jesus gets really bummed and wrapped in our culture today. But the truth is that what Jesus did for those three and a half years of his ministry is he went around and he did good for people. Man, people welcomed him. They wanted to see him come. Moms and dads who had sick children, do you know what they did with those sick children? They got them to Jesus just as fast as they could because he went about doing good and he brought healing to people who were under the tyranny of the devil. On Wednesday nights, our little Bible study is called Becoming Healthy. And our theme verse is John 10.10 10, where Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. That they might have it more abundantly. The first part of that verse is the enemy, the devil, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy you. That's God's plan. That's what I mean, that's Satan's plan. That's what he wants to do with Clayton Houchin's life in 2017. He wants to destroy my life. Jesus said, but I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Peter said to them, hey, I don't know if you knew it or not, but Jesus went about doing good and he healed all who were under the, the tyranny of the devil because God <coughs> was with him. What an amazing man this Jesus was. Peter goes on and he said, you know, I know that this is true because I'm a witness of it. We ourselves are witnesses of this. Going to 39. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. That was probably my fault. You see, we, we, we're witnesses of it. I followed him. I left the Sea of Galilee and I followed along and and I've been a witness of Jesus. Uh, I was His witness for three and a half years. We are His witnesses. I saw what He did in both Judea and up in Jerusalem. We saw that. And yet they, they killed Him by hanging Him on a tree. You see, that's what they did to, to, to Jesus. This man that walked around and did good. And, and He healed people. He did what was right. And you know what they did? They, they killed Him. Who is they? You know who they is? They is those religious folks. They is those people who, who didn't, they didn't, want, they didn't want the truth. They wanted those old rules. They wanted those old traditions. And those people, it wasn't you Romans who killed Jesus. It was them. It was those religious people. They killed Him by hanging Him on a tree. And you know, can I just tell you all this morning that that would be sad news here in Caesarea if that was the end of the story. But the next verse goes on and tells us instead, and that's not the end of the story because God raised this man up. What day do we call that? We call that Easter Sunday morning. Today, 2,000 years later, we celebrate that as the most significant event that has ever occurred in human history is the day that Jesus came up out of the grave. Because if they, they hung Him on a tree, if He was still there, that's really bad news. But the fact that He came back to life, that, my friend, is really, really good news. See, they raised Him up on the third day, and, and, and God permitted Him to be seen. You know what? I don't know if you're here today and you're a scientist, and you're about all the facts and the data, if you're about the facts and data, can I just, Clayton, can I just encourage you to go out and to study and to do research about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? There is incredible evidence for the fact that that event really did happen. And the biggest part of that evidence is the fact that Peter says, hey, for God permitted him to be seen, not by everybody, but by us. I was there. I saw him. 
I saw him with my own eyes, and not just me, but all 12 of the disciples, and not just that, but all of his close followers, and not just that. There was one time there was 500 people who saw Jesus alive. If any of you all here in, in uh, Caesarea, if you're doubting that story, just go to Jerusalem. You'll find a bunch of those people still alive today who saw Him. He, God permitted Jesus to be seen alive. Not by all these people, but by us. Witnesses appointed beforehand by God. God chose me a long time ago that I would see Jesus alive. Abraham didn't see it. God made a promise to Abraham way 4,000 years ago. Abraham never saw it. But me, Simon Peter, I got to see it. Can I just take a minute and tell you about how I got to see it? I ate with him and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I'll never forget that morning. We were, we'd been, we'd been fishing. Jesus had, had died and, and, and I'd kind of gone on vacation and kind of just needed to get away. It had been such a long, stressful, emotional time. And, and I told my boys, I told the disciples, I said, I'm gone fishing. And they said, hang on, Peter, we'll go with you. And so, you know, I'd been a professional fisherman. I was really, I was a really good fisherman. That's how I made my living before I started following Jesus. We went out that night, and, <laughs> and I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that we, we, we fished all night and did not catch one single fish all night long. And I was kind of taking it on the chin. They were, they were ragging me pretty hard. Peter, come on. You're a professional fisherman. You bring us out here. We fish all night. We don't get one fish. And, and I took that pretty hard. And, we were headed back towards shore. Some guy on the shore was standing on the shore. He said, hey guys, how's the fishing? And I looked at the boat and I said, a smart aleck, who do you think he is telling us how to fish? Not, it's not too good, sir. And the man on, the, and the, man on the, the shore, he said, cast out on the other side of the boat. <laughs> right, sir, thank you for your input. <laughs> Come on, guys, throw it over there one time. We'll just show him. We threw the net to the other side of the boat. And you know what happened? That net filled up with fish. And it was all we could do to keep the nets from breaking. And then John, John was standing there and he looked and he said, Hey Peter, I think it's the Lord. And I looked and it was the Lord. And I jumped in and I jumped in the water and I swam to shore. I said, guys, y'all bring the boat. I'm going to go talk to Jesus. And I got there and you know what? <laughs> he, he, he built a little fire there. Jesus said, he cooked us a full fish breakfast. And all the guys finally made it and they brought the fish in. But, but Jesus had already caught enough fish that morning and we ate fish. We had a full broiled fish breakfast there with Jesus that morning. Man, I'll never forget that morning. I thought I'd never... I thought on that Friday afternoon, I thought I'll never eat with Jesus again. That's all over with. It'll never happen again. And this morning on the side of the seashore... Man, there he was. And I knew my life would never, ever be the same because I had just had a personal contact with the risen Jesus Christ. I would never be the same. I ate with him and I drank with him after he rose from the dead. You know what he did then, verse 42? He commanded us to preach to the people. That's why I'm here today. That's when Sergeant, Corn why, when Sergeant Cornelius called me. That's why I came very quickly. I wanted to come and share with you. That's why I'm here today. Because Jesus told us, hey, go preach to the people. And I figured I'd be preaching to all my Jewish friends for the rest of my life. I never imagined I'd be here with a bunch of you all folks who were very different from me. Jesus told us to solemnly testify that He is the one appointed by God. May I just gently say with the love of my heart, a lot of folks out there today will say, well, why, why do you, you narrow-minded, Bible-thumping Christians, why do you say that Jesus is the only way? Why, can you, why are you so narrow-minded? Well, it's because, it's because the Bible tells us that He is the one that was appointed by God. Jesus was one, He was the one appointed by God to come to earth and to die on the cross so He could, he could pay for my sins. May I, just, may I just encourage you, I don't know what religion you're from or what religion you've had, may I just suggest to you that every other religion has man trying to satisfy God. The Bible teaches just the opposite of that. 
The Bible teaches us that man, because of his sin, is entirely, completely unable to ever satisfy God's righteous demands. You know what the Bible teaches? The only hope that I have, the only hope is for me to come to the place where I realize in my life that I can never satisfy God's righteous demands on my life. But you know what? Jesus can. He took my place and He died on the cross and He paid the debt for my sins. Now I'm telling you, that's really good news. I don't have to do anything to try to satisfy God because His Son has already done it for me. Now if I want to live the rest of my life as a thank you note, because of what He did for me. He's all about that. But I will never in my life satisfy God's righteous demands. And so God appointed one man to be the judge of the living and the dead. The Bible tells us it's appointed unto man to die once, once to die. And after this, the judgment. And what judge are we going to stand from? in front of? We're going to stand in front of Judge Jesus. And He's going to look at my life and He's going to look at your life. He's going to judge us right from wrong and He's going to look and He's going to say, you know what, Houchins? I'm judging you as righteous. Completely righteous before me because you chose to trust what I did for you. There'll probably be somebody else there in line. Judge Jesus will say, you know what? You were a good person and, and, and you made a lot of money and, and you gave a lot of money to philanthropy and you, you had a great title and you have a, a great family name, but you know what? You never trusted me. And so you never met the righteous standard because my standard is absolute holiness. And you can't get there on your own. You have to come through me. That's the only way to get there. God appointed that one to be the judge of the living and the dead. Verse 43 says that all the prophets, Peter says, that's what the whole story is about. That's what the whole book is about. All the testaments, all the prophets, the New Testament and the Old Testament, all the prophets are testifying about that one man. That through that one man in his name, the name of Jesus, everybody who believes in him will receive Forgiveness of sins. Yeah. That's Simon Peter's story to the family and friends of Sergeant Cornelius, those old Romans, those old heathen Gentiles. That was the story that Peter had to share with those folks. And you know what happened in that room? Verse 44 goes on and tells us that while Peter was still speaking, you know what happened? The same Holy Spirit, that holy breath, came down and it breathed on a whole bunch of people who heard Peter's message. That's what happened right in the middle of the day. Right in the middle of Peter's story. That same time while he was still speaking. Can I just say to you that that's the story. That's most of Acts chapter 10. That's the story, the simple story of the gospel that Peter shared with those folks. And you know what happened? There were some people out there that raised their hands and said, I want some of that. Will you bow your heads with me and close your eyes?